One of the first recorded units of length, the cubit, was created in ancient Egypt. Based on the length of a human forearm, this important idea of a standard unit of length evolved over the next 5,000 years into the measuring systems we use today. The foot is another ancient unit of length. It was probably based on the length of a human foot. The problem, of course, is whose foot? Possibly the length of the king's foot, but kings come and go, along with their feet. In 1324, King Edward II of England proposed a solution involving the inch. The inch represents one twelfth of a foot, and it had been defined as the average width of a man's thumb. This of course has the same problem as the foot. Whose thumbs are we using? Barley was a common grain grown in England. A single grain of barley is called a barley corn. King Edward created a statute that legally defined the inch as three barley corns, dry and round, placed end to end, lengthwise. Three barley corns define an inch, and twelve inches define a foot. King Edward thought he had solved the problem. But of course, like feet and thumbs, not all barley corns are created equal. Despite these problems, the barley corn continued to play a role as the base unit of the British measuring system for centuries. Confusion about the inch continued until 1959, when the international community officially defined the inch as decimal 0254 of a meter. Which of course creates another problem. How do we define a meter? The story of the meter begins in 18th century France. The French faced the same dilemma as everyone else, finding an acceptable base unit of length. A committee of academics was created to solve this problem. In April of 1790, Talleyrand, the Bishop of Autun, made a remarkable proposal to the Assembly of French Weights and Measures. Talleyrand proposed that a unit of length, called the meter, could be based on time. He had been studying pendulums and knew that the period of a pendulum, that is, its rate of swing, was determined by length. Short pendulums swing back and forth rapidly, long pendulums slowly. An interesting fact about pendulums is that the mass of the pendulum bob doesn't affect the rate of swing, and, within certain limits, the amplitude of the swing is also not a factor. The length determines the period of the pendulum. It is possible by adjusting the length to create a pendulum that will take precisely one second to swing from one side to the other. Talleyrand proposed that a pendulum like this, a precision one second pendulum, be constructed and that the length of this pendulum be used as the standard length, one meter. Time would define length, an elegant solution. Talleyrand realized that tiny changes in gravity affected the rate of a pendulum and that gravity changed with location on the planet. So he added to his proposal that this pendulum be created at latitude 45 degrees, a line of latitude passing through France. Talleyrand's proposal was studied for a year, but an expert committee decided that the best definition for a meter was to use one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the pole. Despite the difficulty of actually measuring the distance from the equator to the pole, this definition for the meter prevailed into the 1900s, with bars of various exotic metals being created to represent the official meter. This was not a perfect solution. Even the politics of the time was complicated. Which country would hold the official meter? In 1983, the dilemma appeared to have been solved when the definition of the meter returned to time. The speed of light in a vacuum is defined as 299,792,458 meters per second. This means that one meter is the distance that light travels in this fraction of a second. We are now using time to define the meter, just like Talleyrand's pendulum-based meter of 1790. It may have occurred to you that we still have a problem. How do we determine one second? We could say that one second is the time it takes light to travel 299,792,448 meters, 
but then we need an independent definition of the meter. We don't have one. At the moment, one second is defined using the oscillations of a cesium atom. This leaves the meter defined by time. We have connected length and time. Perhaps this simple idea of defining length using time led Einstein to the revelation that time and space are linked. You may want to create Talleyrand's pendulum of 1790 and prove for yourself that a one meter pendulum creates a one second swing. A simple way to do this is to create a pendulum with a length of one meter and measure its period with a watch. Changing the length of the pendulum changes its period. As I mentioned earlier, the mass of the bob isn't important. The amplitude of the swing is also not a significant factor as long as it does not exceed 15 degrees. The length of the pendulum determines the period. Length is the distance from the pivot to the center of gravity of the bob. In the case of a spherical bob, the center of gravity is the center of the sphere. The formula describing the motion of a pendulum is time equals 2 pi times the square root of length divided by g. g is acceleration due to gravity. This value varies with location, but 9.8 meters per second squared is an average value that can be used in the formula. Length must be in meters and time in seconds. If you solve this equation for a one meter pendulum, you will get an answer of two seconds for time. This is because it calculates the time for a complete oscillation of the pendulum, the actual period of an oscillating object. More videos and science projects can be found at our website, hyloroad.com. Follow the projects link.